Hey, I just wanted to do a video on carving some bracing. I had done a big video. It was like an hour long of getting to this part and the files all got corrupted and I lost them. But I'll go back and make more videos later. But I just wanted to make this one specifically about copying these specs from a 1937 pre-war Martin. And what I did was I'm in the 40 foot radius. I sanded the bottoms after I thicknessed them this way, glued them on because it's a lot easier to glue them on when the tops are flat. I don't like to pre-shape my braces. I think that works good in a factory setting if you're using a vacuum clamp or something to save time, but I think it takes more time if you try to do that and then use the go bar sticks to hold them in place. And then I went to my heights. And I've got these specs. If you want these specs, these are from a guy that um, measured everything inside his 1937 Martin D D18. And that's what we're going for here. This is forward shifted. And this is all torrified wood. So you've got a torrified double A top and torrified bracing. And I just went over some of the basics. Like if you're using the chisel. If you want to flatten things, use the flat side. When you're carving in, use this side. And when you're using a chisel, I like this these Japanese chisels because you can put your thumb on it and you don't want to snow plow things straight. You actually always want to be sliding at an angle cutting with the chisel. And that's one thing I talked about in the video. And with this torrified wood, it's really easy to chip and tear out so I go pretty easy but the first thing I did was establish the top heights and then I marked my peaks and these were just in the way so of course I knocked those down because they were up here and I was trying to scallop that um, when I did the scallops what I do is I just go in from both sides I don't recommend chiseling towards yourself but if you're doing the scallop you can start from here, flip your work and do it. So that's the only time I do ever really carve towards myself, but I only carve towards my body. Just keep your fingers and um, palms and everything out of the way if the chisel were to slip. You'll get better at that stuff over time if you're not used to using a chisel. Um, I took all the edges that taper into the kerfing that'll be locked into the body, which is the X and the shoulder brace. These are gonna get trimmed off you can tuck those in if you want, but it's a lot of extra work for not really getting much result. And then we took these down to almost nothing. Um, and then when I did these, I have a little trick. Let me get my... This little magical guy. This has just been tapered thickness to 50 thousands and when I do these I put it right next to it and right now those are perfectly flush and I just get a little stroke and carve that till it's flush with this and that way when you go to cut these into your kerfing you just set your you mark them set your router bit to 50 thousands and you just go on that slot and I mean you can get these to fit like a glove it's really nice um, so I went over all that and the next thing I was going to do is just, so after I did the scallops, then I do the rounding and I kind of already did most of the stuff I do with a chisel, except for over here, you could still use a good bit of chisel on this shoulder brace, but I like to get it nice and sideways and go with that. We'll get a little more into that in a second. Um, but I did my favorite thing to use for rounding these things over is this tiny little Ibex plane. And these guys, because you don't have to worry about it gouging too much because it's a plane, so it's not going to do that. But you can really get in there and get it nice. Sorry, I guess I'm a little clumsy this morning. Get a real nice taper on everything. And um, also went over the fact that, you know, I like my braces to be very cathedral shaped 
so they're just nice and round um, the peaks especially and it's more aesthetically pleasing um, they do technically say you know you could do sharp triangular braces and that's going to be the most efficient shape but um, I don't think it's necessary I don't think you're going to notice a big difference just something like that but um but getting these guys nice and round and of course we'll go back and sand stuff later if you really want it to look like a 1930 spartan i will tell you they did not really sand them after this type of process they would chisel them and they would probably have some type of plane like this maybe use a file or a rasp small rasp or something but they don't look like they went in and sanded them all to me, the ones I've seen. And this just gives us a nice little roundedness to everything. Went ahead and did the bridge plate. We've got the grain of the bridge plate going at about a 45 degree angle from, because we don't want it to go this way because the pins holes are going to be in line and it could split one big crack right where all those pinholes are because all the pressure is coming in the same way and we don't want it to go straight into up and down to the top because then it's not going to be very good of a reinforcement for the top so that's why they put the grain at this angle or even flat sawn would be a good way to do the uh, bridge plate only thing i have left to glue on are these tiny little sound hole supports and i'm not going to do a huge one but you know you can leave a tongue brace out but talking to repair guys, that is an area that does seem to collapse on some of the pre-war Martins. So I'd still recommend putting a little something here. Is it a huge tone killer? I really don't think so. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in the building world. And, you know, if you're marketing a no-tongue bridge, they'd say it has more low end. Kind of hard to tell. I think if you just make the guitar sound really good for what it is, that's the best way to do it. Um... And this one, you know, I did want to touch on, we're going over these specs from a 1937 D18. But um, one thing to keep in mind, you know, I, I'm going to say copying a 1937 Martin, but what we have to keep in mind is, you know, back then they had uh, violin making luthiers that came to America to escape the Holocaust and stuff that were really talented from families that had been making violins for years and you know guitars were new at the time and they got jobs there and these guys really knew how to tap tune and read the wood and make these things sound great and they they were probably starting something bigger than this um, spec wise and then they were tuning this in by ear so I mean this is this is a copy of, you know, and you'll notice they're not really even like these peaks are in different places and And these guys knew what they were doing and they weren't they weren't going off a sheet um, So that's one thing to keep in mind is that We're kind of just copying what they did and that's When the war ended and those guys left that's what Martin's been doing ever since Mostly I'm sure they have some great guys there now um, but it's hard to beat the uh 1930s Adirondack and guys that had been from violin making families when they didn't have TV and just built in instruments all the time. Um, so anyways, let's get carving on the shoulder brace. All right. So for this to get started, I'm just gonna push kind of flat on it, ride this angle here pretty thick right now and this torrified stuff loves to split and kind of chip out so I'm keeping that in mind and another thing to keep in mind when you're going on the side you don't want to be dragging this corner of your chisel and just basically slicing all that grain you're gonna put a real weak spot in the top if you do that so I try to keep an imaginary line about an eighth inch up from the base because you don't really need to round anything off lower than that, especially not on the shoulder brace. You can kind of hit it with sandpaper later and get all the curves in or 
the microplane. Just kind of get that shape. Get another stick so it could slide around. There we go. That's more like what I get, usually just a nice long curl. There we go. If you feel it coming out, you can kind of step back, dig in a little deeper. We are using the flat side, of course, because we're we don't want to dig in too far. We used the other side when we did the scallops and the tapers. And remember how I said you want that cutting motion. It's kind of hard to do here because you're going to be sliding out. So. We are kind of snow plowing right now, where we're just pushing straight and hoping that it cuts. It's really important to keep your chisel sharp for this stuff because the duller it is, the more gouging and stuff you're going to have. And we're getting a nice crown here. I'll probably say crown or cathedral shape. Um, just rounding it off. And now I can get, I'm gonna get a little closer to that bottom and just kind of blend everything in. But without touching the top, just close to the bottom. Just a little over here, like these two. Got this line on the top, this thickness, and that's kind of that's my final height, so I'm not really touching that. And now you can just kind of go with a little plane, round her off. Depending on where your truss rod is going to be, some people drill a hole here. I don't do that. I just this brace isn't really that tall on these, and. I find it's totally easy to get a ball end wrench up there, even a straight one, or um, just a normal bent truss rod tool. I don't like the huge truss rod tools though, but that's one thing to keep in mind is if you do need to do that, if you're building a pre-war style Martin like this video is about, you probably don't need to because you're going to be going with this size shoulder brace. Um, let's see. All right, what else can we do? These are all pretty well tapered. And, you know, this chart had the specs for the minimum heights on the all these. We kind of just copied them. Oh, there is, I did want to show you this peak. I saved to carve that on this guy. So let me just flip this guy around. This is where it gets really messy. All right, this is the guy I wanted to carve in front of you guys. Um, I left one side flat, so you can see the truth. So, usually I work this way, just because if you get anything 
shipping out, you want it to go away from your main brace, but I know I'm not going to go too far today and it can kind of just taper off the top there. So I mean just light strokes, not digging into the top. And I had kind of already done the other side, so. Now you can see we've got this nice little point. There we go. Kind of get a little bit of this around that a little bit. And I'm not using a lot of pressure. I mean, I'm really letting the blade do the work. And then go ahead and touch this up. I love this little planter. This it's freaking wonderful. All right, what else can you do? Let's see. We need to take these down. So. So now we're digging in, so I'm going to use the chisel backwards. I've got my peak mark there. This is a weird angle for the camera for me to stand. It will literally hit you in the eyeballs when they chip up. And these are not tucking into the kerfing. So these are going down to almost nothing, and I'll probably actually just cut some of the end off so there's enough room for the curving from my body outline. Got that? This guy? Gotta love that nice, dry wood. Remember to keep your shop at about 50% humidity. You don't want it too dry. Because then it'll go outside and expand and crack. And you'll have lots of problems when it comes back to that humidity. Alright, so we got those guys down. I'm going to come in from the side here. Give them a little peek. Again, not digging into the top itself. I'm gonna go in some from that side, some from this side. Kind of just working that little triangle shape. There we go. Now we're getting somewhere. not much it can maybe even go a little smaller because these are basically there to prevent cracks All right. sorry if my face is blocking the view or the side of my head Always notice when you do this, your peaks aren't as pronounced because you're kind of tapering them into everything. And that's still, I don't know if you can really tell from that angle, but it's still very fat and wide. And if you look at pictures of these on old Martins, they are not even that wide. They are like just little tiny points. And we're going to get rid of some more meat off here. I'm not left-handed, I'm just doing this for the video. And again, that's why I really like this chisel. There's all these places to get an extra hand on it. Fortunately, you can't get them anymore. 
now you think this was like 200 bucks, but now you can only get ones like this that are like three to 400. want everything to look like it really flows into each other. Okay, cool. So, let's see, let me see what we can see from there. So I'm gonna go ahead and taper some of this guy. Now I marked out this two inch, two inch. I'm gonna go a little closer to that but just to start this taper start back here All right. just riding that side there. We'll go a little easy on that side in the future. Once you get the heights established, it's, it's not too much work doing the sides. You'd be surprised how much you're really taking off. And if you're newer at this, you might want to mark center lines when you do that. That's up to you. I find, you know, it's only so wide, you can kind of just eyeball it. And again, you know, it's more about the sound. It's not, I think gluing your braces in the correct position um, and having them glued on good material brace material and you know your basic scalloping and peaking and heights and everything are the most important things probably in that order um, so I mean a lot of the other stuff is gonna be looks and now we're just dealing with very small adjustments of things I just don't like to have things real big and sharp. Let's see here. Alright. Alright. I'm gonna go ahead and do this other one. And these glue the little braces on something up here. And I'll be back.